Hi friend, welcome back to the show and today we have Tengku Zafro here with us who is a caretaker minister of finance and this time around will be the first time that he is competing for an election campaign in the seat of Kuala Selangor, right? Yes. For yourself who have a corporate experience going into ministry who's known to be a not so efficient mm. place and you've led it for almost two years actually. Yep. Yeah. What are uh, some of your views about this? More than two years. Yeah. Uh, more than two years, yeah. What are some of your views on this? Well, I think it's a bit unfair uh, because there is a, it's a, it's a gross generalization uh, based uh, on my work experience with the civil servants. I mean, there are pockets where inefficiency, just like corporates. Uh, but in general, if you look at the dedication, you know, in more than uh, two and a half years at the Ministry of Finance, I've met many dedicated civil servants, uh, not only in the ministry that I'm in, which is a uh, Ministry of Finance, but also in other ministries and other agencies. Uh, and I must say that they work hard, if not harder, than em employees uh, in my previous uh, life. Right? They, they even like the preparation of the budget, uh, two weeks they stay over in the uh, oh, wow. in the office. Yeah, we have rooms and they stay over. What I can say is that uh, my experience in the Ministry of Finance uh, are among the most dedicated. Uh, individuals uh, I have met. Since you say that there's not too much of difference to a certain extent, but uh, probably basically due to our our misunderstanding of the situation. However, right, many people still feel that like there can be improvement that yes, can be made yes, yes. in ministry to make it more efficient so that benefits can reach to people more directly and stuff like that. Since you are the person that is uh, coming in, you know, uh, and you led it for two years plus, what are some of the thoughts regarding this? What are some of the change that you can bring to the table to make the mm -hmm. ministry more efficient so that the people can benefit no, I agree with you. Uh, like in any organization, the ministry is the same. Uh, we must always strive uh, for improvement. So, for example, uh, what we did is when we launched new initiatives, when we disbursed this fund uh, to this NGO or to this uh, SME, did they survive? And did the NGO use it for uh, mm. useful needs and meet their targeted uh, uh, objective? Right. So sometimes last time it was, okay, we disbursed, we've done our job. But now you have to go all the way uh, to the outcome. So what we did was we need to uh, improve the process, uh, have a structure. So we uh, established Laksana. This is like a monitoring agency uh, to track the implementation of all these activities. So it's not just to disburse, but le looking at the outcome. Uh, so in, during my tenure as a finance minister, we then make it transparent, uh, the report that the Laksana team look at. Uh, during when it comes to implementation of that. So to date, we have issued 113 reports, 113 reports. 113 uh, reports? Yeah, it's called Laporan Kuang and Rakyat, and we send it to the media as well, and it's available uh, online. So people can see. But there is pro and cons. Uh, cons is when people see that, eh, how come uh, we disbursed late, or how come um, this company that we disbursed didn't do as well? But to us, it's good because then we will strive to improve as well because it comes with transparency and accountability. And yeah. it also means that we look at all the other agencies as well. So agencies and ministries are also under pressure, right? So they say that, hey, if you don't do properly, uh, this report will go out and it's public document, which, and a detailed one also is given to cabinet every month, right? Right. So, I actually true, didn't true. know that Malaysia actually started to set up that. Uh, did we have this thing prior to you joining in as a finance minister? Uh, no, before that we didn't have. Right, uh, it was monitored by the respective agencies. So there are, like I said, some agency may be more uh, detailed than others. Uh, but we had a, this centralized agency called Laksana that will monitor all. Uh, mm. It's like a report card as well. Right. Uh, but what's important is this time it's not just a report for us to look at uh, and for the agencies to see where they are, but also for the public. Public. Yeah. to scrutinize yes. and to transparency check, right? means more accountability as well that's great right uh, where, where do we find this laksana report well, it's on Malaysia, uh, mof website right mof uh, website yeah and we issue it to the media uh, and they cover it uh, every week as well right so if you guys want to know uh, what mm. uh, tengku safar has been doing over the past uh, two years plus right yes. uh, what are some of the things that have been executed you can go and check out the mof site and check out the laksana report currently right now you are representing what the oldest coalition in malaysia but over the past few years you've been tainted with a lot of bad news, lah, right? Mm. And it seems like there are also many people who are not very happy with the coalition. Mm. So how do you feel about this? Being one of the new player coming in, right? Yep. What kind of change do you think you can bring to the table by being an MP?
It's going to be the year 2023 very soon. I know many of you will be thinking about New Year's resolutions, setting new financial goals and stuff like that. But we all know it's not easy to plan or achieve those things. So from November to December, we'll be organizing a financial literacy month. There will be free weekly workshops and activities to help you figure out your financial goals, plans and turn it into action for 2023. On top of that, when you attend our workshops, you will stand a chance to win some awesome Apple products as well. So sign up and reserve a spot for yourself via the link below. Well, Barisan National, like any other parties and like any other organization, have its uh, you know, challenges, uh, history, uh, legacies and differences in views. Um, but I'll, you know, I'm pleased to, 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 to see and uh, that's when the list was announced, uh, or list of candidates was announced for Barisan National, 70% uh, of the candidates uh, are new. Uh, so to me, this indicates a new perspective, right? Uh, a new way of thinking. And the manifesto itself uh, will sh have shown that we are, uh, you know, we have out of box solutions uh, for Malaysia, and we hope uh, that the manifesto will address some of this. Challenge. One of the things that uh, a lot of people are calling for right now is for clean government. Mm. Yeah, with all these corruption cases coming around and so on. Mm. Now, I understand that if let's say you have the chance of being a finance minister, because that's where the money is, right? You mm. are the guy who controls the money. What are some of the things that can mm. be done to ensure that we reduce corruption in general? Mm -hmm. Well. There are many ways to do it, right? Uh, the root of corruption really is from the person itself, right? Uh, it's, it's how you grow up as a person, uh, the family, support, everything. So that, let's not talk about that one. That's about moral values, right. about your, uh, your, your principles, right? Mm -hmm. What your question is about what we can do yeah, today. What right? kind of structural yeah. changes yeah, structural can be changes. implemented? Correct. We are going to introduce a Fiscal Responsibility Act, yeah, the FRA. Uh, so this FRA, will make it more transparent, uh, the expenditure, uh, more accountable on what our targets are and all that. So it's, it's something that will help uh, also make it uh, more uh, finances, our public finance more disciplined, uh, more transparent, uh, will be more accountable uh, because it will be reported uh, to parliament and it become a law, right? our uh, fiscal uh, responsibility. If it's possible, can you share with us a little bit about uh, what's inside FRA? Uh, well, it's not possible right now because it has to go through the process. It's going to be a bill, it's a law, all right? and we have to present it to the parliament. And when the bill is presented, uh, the public can see it. I think it's too early to say it, uh, but I've given a timeline that the next parliament session, uh, we are going to present it. It's already been presented to cabinet, it's, uh, and cabinet has agreed to support it. Uh, uh, AGC is finalising it. Uh, so I think uh, under the Official Secrecy Act, uh, we have to wait until it goes to Parliament. Over the years, Malaysia has done pretty well in terms of uh, lifting people out of poverty ever since the 1970s uh, with the NEP policy and so on. But it seems like even until today, the wealth gap is still a very huge issue mm. in Malaysia. Mm. And, and the truth is this, regardless of ways, mm. uh, wealth gap exists not just between a Malay and Chinese or Malay and Indian or Indian and Chinese in, inter-race, but intra-race itself. Mm. Wealth gap is a... Yep. It's getting bigger and bigger. Yep. So, what are our thoughts about this? So, what the government has done, uh, which remains relevant today, will emphasize on economic policies that are pro-growth. Right? This will help. And then priority must be given to education um, in order to increase uh, the income opportunities and also investment in national development. Uh, this is uh, you know, infrastructure and everything. Uh, so, really, it is an issue that we have to address. Uh, we also have a target of poverty rate of uh, zero uh, by 2025, uh, right? mm -hmm. uh, but the issue of in, uh, the wealth gap between uh, in the like you say inter-race, uh, it's something that has to be addressed by making the economic pie bigger. Uh, so that is the main uh, focus uh, of any government actually mm. uh, to reduce that gap and making sure that the distribution of wealth. Uh, becomes better as the economic pie grows. Another one thing is that Malaysia has done pretty well in 2022 in terms of bringing in FDI. But what are some of the plans to make sure that this FDI truly translate into wealth into household? Because we know that FDI comes in, it sometimes may not actually translate into household. But what are some of the things that we can ensure that it really ends up going into the pockets of the people and mm. household increasing their income? Yep. Well, Malaysia, as you correctly said, attracts large uh, investments. We really want to make sure that the government now going forward uh, will focus on FDI must link to income uh, in, uh, opportunities or in, uh, by linking incentive uh, to high paying jobs. Uh, but also to ensure that when people come here, they also provide uh, training, reskilling and upskilling 
uh, for the uh, for the for the Malaysian workforce. Mm. So, so we don't want foreign investors come in, build factory, but all the workers are foreign, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, because I know. Yeah. doesn't really help Malaysia in that yes, case. Correct. That's a great thing. Uh, let's go into a little bit questions about your first election campaign. This time you're competing in Kuala Selangor constituent. Now, yes. uh, why were you chosen for Kuala Selangor? Were, were, yeah. you, were you from there or what? If you look at Kuala Selangor, um, Kuala Selangor is like a mini Malaysia. Right? It's like a mini Malaysia uh, because it's ethnic makeup as well. You know, we have Indians, Chinese, and Malays as well. Uh, and you know, it's very diverse. You have the fishing communities along the coast, right? And then you have all the way to the affluent urban areas uh, in, uh, in uh, like Puncha Alam where the professionals and all that mm. stay. And they also palm oil estates as well uh, in that area and kampongs and everything. So it's like a mixture of everything, right? Uh, demography wide. So all this diversity combines to make Kuala Selangor a place with huge uh, potential, tourism, development, everything. Uh, and it has a long way then to go to maximize the potential uh, if all the issues are addressed uh, in a timely manner. So I believe that by working together, we can really help uh, Kuala Selangor realize its full potential. What are some of the challenges do you think the residents and businesses in Kuala Selangor are actually facing? Yeah. So when I went down to see the people, uh, the main issues were employment, as we would expect, right? Uh, education is very key, right? Uh, and also infrastructure. So for example, I recently uh, visited the local fishing community and they complain about their jetties. Uh, the jetties are very old, uh, need some repair, maintenance, poor, um, you know, and actually quite dangerous. So I went there for myself. Because a lot of people go there to see what's happening. It can be a part of the local tourism as well. If elected, uh, so this will be definitely one of my uh, top priorities. What are some of your plans to improve the quality of life for the people in Kuala Selangor? My manifesto uh, will, uh, to the people of Kuala Selangor. Yeah. I, will, I hope you have a chance to read. I have a manifesto as well, oh. just for the people of Kuala Selangor. Uh, it has to be visionary, uh, long term, uh, you know, uh, not the you know usual generic you know helicopter view, you know, thirty thousand feet above the you know views ideas. Uh, in the last few months, I've gone down to the ground at least two hundred times, right? Two hundred in those two hundred times, I realized that the people of Kuala Sango uh, still suffer from basic issues um, the, that affect their quality of life, right? Issues like roads, right? Unsafe roads, the things that repair, you know, you know. Rubang, you know, Rubang and all that, all the hundred. Lack of road lamps, also local government services, infrastructure jobs, and many more. Right? So, uh, you know, there's no point of me to point out a visionary uh, manifesto. If the people of Kuala Selangor still suffer from these daily issues, no point of a visionary one. What we need to do is, my first promise is to ensure that these daily issues are resolved first, right? Uh, with about uh, 50 initiatives to help that. So when you read, my manifesto, what we, know, we identify what are the daily issues they face and these are the issues that we will resolve as soon as I'm elected. Uh, after that, I want to make sure that I do continuously listen to the issues, you know, and understand and empathize, right, and then resolve the issues by having, a, you know, again, like the Laksana way, uh, we have an effective and transparent relationship with the voters uh, via allocation of resources. Uh, we'll have a Pusat both physical and virtual, uh, and many more, you know, and then I will have a KPI and I will report back what I have done, mm. right? So that people can see, right? Uh, it's like a report card. Very, very, very corporate style, huh? After mm -hmm. that, do the work, I must show you a report kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. So it's like Bringing back the, the, the yeah. true, true blue corporate culture, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, just one last question mm, before we yes. go. Now you're going down a lot to the ground, but uh, I'm sure that uh, if, let's say, you win this election and you are elected as an MP and you take on some ministerial position, post-election, what are some ways that your constituents can reach you? Yeah, of course I'll be going down uh, as I should uh, on a very uh, on a timely manner, on a, on a regular way. But we have the Pusat Himat, which will open six days a week, right? Only one day off now for the team on the ground. Uh, we also have a virtual Pusat Himat, so we'll continue. And I've also committed that any money that I get from the government will be transparent, show where it goes. Uh, and 100% will go to the Parliament of Kuala Selangor. Alright, mm. thank you very much Zafra for answering this question. So guys, uh, if you are an eligible voter, do not forget to go out and vote this GE15. Because at the end of the day, you are the kingmakers. You are the guys who are going to decide who's going to represent you, right? So don't forget, please go out and vote. Vote, go and vote. To be very honest, um, 
I was actually very content uh, in my life uh, in the corporate world. Yeah? Uh, as well as something I must admit I used to enjoy and doing. As you know, I mean, we have friends in the corporate world choosing to be uh, in the public sector means uh, sacrificing, for example, good pay, right? uh, yeah. good compensation. So why move? I must stress uh, that this is really not at all about that. Right? Um, for me, uh, the opportunity to roll up my sleeves right, uh, and contribute to our nation, you know, our beloved nation, especially at a time right, in 2020, in March 2020, during the time of crisis, the height of the pandemic. And today we have uh, challenges as well with the inflation rates and everything else. Uh, but truthfully, it is a life-changing experience for me, um, as well as a meaningful and a worthwhile calling.